So, yeah. I may have left something out at the end of the last video. In the last episode, we discussed how, during the Proterozoic Eon, the Earth froze into a giant snowball three different times. These events may have caused mass extinctions each time, and the ones who survived would evolve into new species that would fill the niches left vacant by the ones who didn't make it. As you can see, I clearly missed one. There has been fossil evidence found that suggests that at the end of the Ediacaran, there was a fourth major glaciation. And this would be the event that brought the entire eon to a close. Now, there's a lot that still isn't known about this glaciation. In fact, some scientists aren't even convinced that it happened. But if it did, it would help explain one of the most dramatic and mysterious events in all of Earth's history. It's thought to have made life increasingly difficult for many of the squishy guys that were around at that time. As we move into the beginning of the Paleozoic era. Remember that poll I did a couple weeks ago where I asked what era you all wanted me to focus on the most? Well, here you go. We finally actually made it to a time period complex enough to actually be covered by most major documentaries. There's going to be a lot of changes moving forward from here. And it all started with... Wait. Hey. Where'd Tim Tim go? Tim Tim! What the crap are you doing? Some of the smarter squishies are trying to survive by hiding out in burrows. Alright, well, you gotta come out. People apparently like seeing you for some reason. Screw you, it's cold! <sighs> Whatever, I'm going on without you then. As the world recovered from this big freeze, the life that managed to eke out a living by being hardy enough or by taking refuge in burrows were about to go through an amazing transformation. Around 541 million years ago, as the oceans thawed out once again, there would be a ton of new niches left open, and the survivors would be ready to take advantage. There was one thing missing from this puzzle of evolutionary forces. One thing that made this event stand out more than just adaptive radiation like we've discussed before. And that one thing would change everything from this time moving forward. You see, up until now, the animals that we have discussed only got their energy and nutrients by passively feeding on photosynthetic organisms through filter feeding or slurping goo out of the sand. But now, for the very first time, we see animals actively hunting and eating other animals. And this would change the game forever. Suddenly, it wasn't enough to simply have the means of collecting food and a strategy to survive whatever the Earth was throwing at us. Now, all of a sudden, animals Animals were out to get other animals, and the ones who didn't figure out a way to respond to this were easy prey. The first thing that every animal needed if they were going to survive in this competitive new ocean was a way to detect other animals around them. And luckily, there was already many different creatures that had basic light-sensing organs on their heads. This may have first evolved during one of the glaciations to find areas where the ice was thin enough for light to shine through. And now it'll become the basis for the very first eyes. And it seems that eyes may have actually evolved simultaneously in different unrelated groups. This is a process called convergent evolution, a term that you should remember because it's going to come up a lot as we move forward through time. Basically, this is when two unrelated species evolve similar strategies or body types despite not being closely related. But now that animals could see one another, now they needed a way to deal with each other. There would be two major body plans that would really take off during this time, or at least two major players that we're going to be focusing on moving forward. The first group would have a hard biomineralized layer of armor around the outside of their body. This exoskeleton would protect them from attacks from carnivores and become a staple feature among the arthropods. The other would develop a flexible dorsal cord that became the central point of the animal's nervous system, while also allowing for greater maneuverability and speed. This would become the template for every animal under the phylum chordata, in other words, the very first vertebrates thus making this one of our earliest ancestors. This evolutionary arms race between animals trying to basically one-up one another would become the driving force behind the Cambrian Explosion, where the combination of all these factors would culminate in adaptive radiation going into overdrive. From 541 to 516 million years ago is the time that we call the Cambrian Explosion. 
Because of niches opening up and certain groups becoming predators, the oceans quickly filled with a menagerie of new, more complex forms of life than anything we've ever seen before. The basal vertebrate and arthropod body plans had started reinventing themselves into every possible form nature could come up with. And it is impossible for me to be able to list off every new type of creature that we see in the fossils from this time. I feel like I could make several list videos talking about the different bizarre animals of this time in the same vein as my Triassic Weirdo video. As this time started out, it seems that a group of arthropods called the Radiodonts started to become one of the most dominant groups. They in many ways share a lot of similarities with shrimp and lobsters, but maybe if you cross those with the face huggers from the Alien franchise. The rest of the Animal Kingdom had to come up with something, because squishy worms and sponges were not going to be enough. Some of the next things that we see evolve are what scientists call the small shelly fauna. These were things like the first gastropods, brachiopods, and trilobites. Now it's impossible to say for sure if trilobites are actually the direct descendant of Sprigina, like I said in the Ediacaran, but I personally feel like there's something of a family resemblance. But Spurgina was soft-bodied, more like a worm, and definitely not like the pillbug-like critters of the Cambrian. And it's also believed that the worm-like creatures branched out into those primitive chordates. And that's the path that I'm going to take this time, because that's the path that will inevitably lead to me becoming human again. Alright. Well, at least I have a spine. One of the earliest known chordates appeared around 535 million years ago. Named Hykuichthys, many think it shows characteristics of being the first ever fish. And even though that's probably a broad generalization, it's likely that it was at least very fish-like. At only an inch long, with a flexible nerve cord on its back, this gave our ancestors a whole new strategy of avoiding arthropod predators. Echinoderms also evolved during the Cambrian as well, an expansive group that encompasses starfish, sea urchins, sand dollars, and sea cucumbers, as well as a group called cranoids or sea lilies that look more like plants than animals at a surface level. Despite having a mineralized layer as well, these guys pretty much all use the strategy of avoiding the notice of other animals. And in addition to all these groups that would give rise to many of the different groups of animals that we see today, there was also some really, really bizarre stuff. Stuff like the Cambrian freak show known as Hallucigenia. Now with a name like that, you know this is going to be good. This biological erector set is supposed to be some sort of stem velvet worm, and one of the most outlandish things to come out of our planet's deep past. It was originally believed that these tentacle spine things were legs. Some even thought that each one ended in a mouth that connected to a central stomach in the trunk. But then in 1991, it was discovered that scientists were actually looking at this thing upside down. Seriously though, can you even blame them? It's now believed that these appendages serve the same purpose as every other major adaptation that we've talked about so far, being some type of defensive spines that these creatures evolved in response to the growing threat of predation in, in the shallow coastal seas of the Cambrian. This was an astounding amount of biodiversity within just a few million years, and we only have a small handful of snapshots to this time that allow us to learn about this pivotal part of our planet's past. So there's no doubt that there was profoundly more creatures inhabiting the Earth that we still haven't discovered. And in fact, we may never discover all of them. As we move into the Middle Cambrian, the oceans become full of life and many of these different groups that got their start in the Cambrian explosion start to specialize. But life on Earth definitely looked very different than it does today. There may have been a few groups here and there that looked somewhat familiar, but for the most part, this was an alien world. The arthropods had further perfected the radiodont design, as well as evolving into several other orders. They came in all different shapes and sizes. One of the most well-known families being a small, five-eyed monster with a long trunk and a claw at the end of it for grabbing prey. It was called Opabinia, and at only seven centimeters long, 
It definitely wasn't the ruler of the seas, but it was a very specialized predator. You see, some creatures continued to use the strategy that had allowed them to survive the end of the Ediacaran to avoid detection by predators, that being digging into the sand. But if there was a food source to exploit, you could bet that this group was ready to go for it. This is believed to have been the reason for Opabinia's weaponized proboscis, swimming along the seafloor searching for signs of worms and things, and then snatching them before they could escape. It's actually believed that predators like this were the main reason why Hallucigenia evolved the way that it did. And the trilobites, mollusks, cranoids, and sponges continued to expand, filling the warm seafloor with life. It was actually around this time that the first corals evolved as well. Although we don't think that they were nearly as widespread as they would be in later periods, we've still found evidence that they can trace their beginnings to this time. So what we are seeing now is a true complete biosphere form, with just one piece missing. The true apex predator. And now, leave it to the arthropods, because they were going to take a form that would change the game for everything living in the Cambrian Oceans. And they did this by getting big. Like, really big by Cambrian animal standards. Up until now, everything that we've talked about was tiny, but by comparison, the massive Anomalocaris was a monster. It measured about a meter or three feet long, and was undoubtedly filling the top predator role by taking a lot of the adaptations we've seen in earlier radiodonts and fine-tuning them for the purposes of capturing and dispatching any prey it wanted. And it seems to have definitely worked. This animal is believed to have hunted and killed anything that its compound eyes could detect. And it probably had the keenest vision of any animal at this time. The long, spiked appendages on its face were its main weapon, as well as its way for manipulating its surroundings. The name Anomalocaris literally means strange shrimp, and it's actually one of the most well-known creatures from this time. It's kind of become right up there with the trilobite as the poster children of the Cambrian Explosion. I guess having a Pokemon made in your image can even bring a half-billion-year-old giant shrimp monster into the limelight. And while all these new forms of invertebrate were evolving, we chordates weren't remaining stagnant either. We did, however, remain fairly small, with the arthropods and other weird creatures filling most of the macro roles in the shallow seas. It was probably a bit of a survival strategy, honestly. Remaining smaller meant that we could remain faster and more maneuverable to avoid monsters like Anomalocaris. In the later Cambrian, we would see another widespread chordate appear on the scene. Oh, Tim Tim. Good. You survived. Tim Tim is now a bit of a mystery creature called a Pikaya. Although being pretty basal, it's believed that Pikaya has most of the general characteristics of a basal chordate, looking a little like a tiny hagfish or lamprey, with a flattened body and a distinct head on the front end. It also had a pair of antennae-like tentacles that made it look more like some sort of gastropod than any vertebrate we know of today. So who knows, really? The Cambrian is talked about as being the focal point of the evolution of life on this planet, and it really is. Every single group that exists today sees the beginnings of some direct origins in the bizarre alien creatures that existed here. But there are countless others that, for one reason or another, didn't make it. And as I said in my video about the Triassic weirdos, these things appear weird to us today because of our perception. So much about our world has changed between now and then, that if I told someone who didn't know any better that this was a concept for a sci-fi fantasy world, they would likely believe me. There are a ton of animals that I didn't get to discuss in this video. And as I said at the start, it would be impossible to give all of these different groups their due credit. So I decided to talk about the most noteworthy ones that play the biggest part in future installments. But for many animals, their story ends here. This is because as the Cambrian came to a close, the world would be racked by a series of events that would cause several different drops in biodiversity. And there's a lot of theories and debates about what caused this. It could have been another round of glaciations, or fluctuation in oxygen yet again, or it could have been a direct result of volcanic activity. It's really not known for sure, but for the animals that did survive whatever took place at the end of the Cambrian, they would be setting the template for the remainder of the Paleozoic era. 
I want to thank everyone for joining me on this journey through the history of the Earth. It's really amazing me how much you all seem to enjoy this despite not getting into any of the more charismatic animals like dinosaurs or mammals. In fact, overall, I have to say that I am blown away by how much my channel has grown recently. I'm going to continue trying my best to make content, and I just cannot tell you all how much it means to me to have this much of a following already. The whole point of this channel is to make educational paleontology videos that are more accessible to the average person and not something that you need a PhD to be able to understand. I try to break things down in a way that can help everyone learn about the history of life on Earth. So if you enjoy this content, I would really appreciate it if you like, share, and subscribe. Have a good one, everybody. See you in the next one.